people. So I was at GalaxyCon this weekend, the three-day event where all the uh, famous actors, actresses, writers, comic book writers, artists, voice actors, comedians, and so on came to show their face here in Minneapolis. This lovely lady here, Margaret Carey, was Tinkerbell. She was also in other various movies and on the Andy Griffin show. For 90 years old, doesn't she look great? Give a round of applause for this lady. As she speaks at one of the panels at the event. Very lovely lady will give you a lot of her background. So stay tuned, hang out, have fun, and enjoy Margaret Carey. Well, I'm so glad you're all here. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Isn't that nice? He thanked me for being here. Uh -huh. I came all the way in from Glendale, Burbank, where it was 85 degrees. Uh -huh. Oh. Uh, I told you that for a reason, but I can't remember what it was. Here she is. Here she is, our DJ. You are our DJ, right? No. I met her yesterday. It's terrible being old. You can't remember who's who. <laughs> anyway. We'll never forget you, though. He is saying all the words. I'm glad he's in the front row. That works. That really, really works. Something to put my cough drops I'm trapped. I tried to start off the chairs for you. I guess I'm not getting an introduction. <laughs> well, because I, I talk a lot, I'm going to start right now. I, my name is uh, Peggy Lorraine McCarty, Peggy Lorraine Lynch, Margaret Carey Brown, Margaret Carey Wilcox, and about six other names. And that's what you did in show business, but actually, I'm mostly known as Tinkerbell. And I'm so happy to be able to talk to you about her. <clears throat> as you can tell, she's one of my favorite characters. And they called me a character when they hired and cast me in the part. Uh, and so I guess we're going to begin. I'm, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to explain to you that I have been in show business 86 years. Mm. I started when I was four. And the reason being is I caused the Great Depression. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, but I was born in 1929 and everything went right downhill from there. <laughs> and my, my mother uh, unfortunately died when I was three and a half. I was adopted by two wonderful people who were old enough to be my grandparents. They took one look at me and said, is she cute? And let's put her in the movies and put her to work. <laughs> and that's how I got started. Now let me show you a picture. Are you ready to, aww. Yes. Aww. Can you see her? Yeah. That was the picture. Why don't you, I'll hold it up and you can grab the mic and talk. Okay. You never aged a bit. Oh, this is, this is Jennifer who is oh. saving my life. This is Jennifer. Oh, uh, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. So that's what I did. And the next thing that I knew, I was uh, doing a movie called Midsummer Night's Dream. It's still a classic. And I still am the fairy in it. There's a trend here, as you can see. <laughs> Worked with Mickey Rooney, the first 
that big picture that he did, and I am dumbstruck. I mean, they um, cast kids in movies then, I don't know whether they still are, who were four years old going on 32. So I'm extremely disciplined all of my life to be there and to be ready, and the director tells you what's happened, and so the next place, I, maybe some of you have seen it. Uh, Our Gang. Have any of you watched Our Gang? Yes? <clears throat> well, that's me with my afro. Uh -huh. And that's Spanky and Scotty Beckett. And I did about eight of those. And during that time, awesome. I learned to tap dance. I can't sing, but I sang in a big movie, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. And. Uh, it was confusing. I, you can imagine, I never saw any other kids except of this big uh, stage, this black stage that you went into, and doors that were humongous. And I was a little tiny, in fact, I was so short and so tiny that I never worked with Shirley Temple because I was shorter than she was. And they never wanted anybody in the scene who was smaller than Shirley, which was correct. I mean, I'm not fussy about that. Thank you. So <clears throat> I did about 37 major motion pictures. I was the blur, you know, that went by or danced or I said hello or I skipped rope and Rebecca or any of those things that they asked me to do. And I kept growing up and I went to a girl's school because you could get a permit to get out to work. Otherwise, in public school, that was very, very difficult. So I did a lot of work, and I, can you see? I am a solo dancer, well known in the business, and if you got on your phones right now and looked under Margaret Carey and the movie If You Knew Susie that starred Eddie Cantor and Joan Davis, you will see my whole dance number on top of a table. How they ever talked me into it, I don't know. But anyway, there I am, and you could certainly come back later and uh, see them close up. Thank you. <clears throat> so we're getting to the part that I want to foreshadow what I want to tell you. I'm going to tell you a little bit, as I just did, about my early days. Then I want to tell you about a fellow named Mark Davis. Some of you may know the name Mark Davis. Well, Mark Davis is, uh, you can put his name with Haunted Mansion, Pirates of the Caribbean, Maleficent, um, Thumper, Flower, and Bambi, uh, Mrs. Darling. Most people don't know he did Mrs. Darling in Peter Pan, and of course, Tinkerbell. <clears throat> he was a fabulous fellow, and at the time, I was just finishing up doing three years with the Almost Broadcasting Company Oh, I beg your pardon, ABC. <laughs> and uh, we did 172 shows, never missed a week, and we did it twice because it was network. That was sort of unheard of. Thank you. That's with Charlie Ruggles, who was quite a famous comedian, a dear man, and every day, oh, I gotta tell you a story about that. I gotta tell you a story about that. <clears throat> we did it live twice, and it was before you did knew anything about cue cards or anything. So if you could watch, we finally got a fellow whose name will come back, and his name is Hal Smith. Do any of you watch the Andy Griffith show? Heck you know, yeah. Otis the Drunk? Yeah. Well, uh, Hal was, was on that show, and I'll tell you how he got the job, because they would take us in the family, and it was our show to remember and do live, and they would give a one-minute commercial that we had to do, which is ridiculous, because I don't know if you know, but if you look at a TV camera, it's a mirror. So you're standing there saying, oh, heck, my hair doesn't look good. Oh, wait a minute, sponsor, I better talk about him for a minute. <laughs> Whatever it is, no cue cards. So <clears throat> I had done three of them. And it was for Dr. Ross dog food is dog gone. <laughs> no. Fido knows best. Fido knows best. So, and these were the years, some of you remember, 
when, when a woman said something was good or you should use it, nobody paid any attention to it. It was the man who had, so my dialogue was this, and I hope you can see me in this light because my dialogue was supposed to be at the end of this commercial. My father thinks Dr. Ross dog food is best for our dog. My brother thinks Dr. Ross dog food is best for our dog, and so do I. Not me, I'm looking at the mirror and I said, my dad likes Dr. Ross dog food, my brother likes Dr. Ross dog food, and so do I. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Then were the days, my friend. So anyway, they hired Hal Smith, who will come into the story a little bit later, and to be the announcer. So I did all of those, and then I went to work, because of ABC, I went to work over at Paramount. And here comes our friend, um, Mark Davis, and the story of how I got the job as Tinkerbell. I was cast in that role. I did one interview, and the next thing I know, I will tell you what Mark Davis said to me. Uh, you see the pictures here, and of course, that's his work. That's me on the sound stage. Can you see it? And there, here's, here's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Can you see the, uh, they gave me props and so on, but here's how it happened. I'm at 20th Century Fox, assistant dance director on a big movie called If You Knew Susie. Uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'll get by. On the picture, I'll get by. And I get a call from my agent who said, can you get the day off tomorrow? Because they are interviewing for a three and a half inch sprite to cast a, a, a character who doesn't talk. And I know that you do that kind of thing. And I said, well. You know, I, we're almost to the big number, and you know, I could ask to get off for a day. She said, it's a Disney. I said, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the way everybody felt. And you know what? They still do. They really do. It's the happiest place to work at a studio. So <clears throat> they told me where to go and what to get them. I have to tell you, I drive up to the gates. And it was, they're not the fancy gates that you have now. They're just gates. And my heart was beating. Now, I had been working since I'm four years old. But my, my heart was beating. I drove up, and lo and behold, the man with the clipboard found my name. <laughs> you don't know the excitement. And then he pointed out where I could park. And he told me exactly where I could go and find the office that I wanted, find the place that I wanted. So I did, and I got out, and I immediately got lost. <laughs> I mean, I was looking for a, a workout room. Well, what they were taking me to, to tell you what Disney does. And they still do to this day at the studio. I'm standing there wondering which way to turn, and I have a couple little things to carry with me, you know, photos and so on. And this gangly man walks up to me and says, you look lost. And I said, I am. I'm supposed to be see a Mark Davis. And I, I'm looking for, for a rehearsal hall. He said, oh, he's in that building, which looks like a bank building, if you've ever looked there. And I said, are you sure? And he says, yeah, I'll take you. He stopped what he was doing, took me in, got the elevator. We went to the famous third floor, walked down, and he says, see that door open? That's Mark's office. You couldn't have that happen at Warner Brothers. You couldn't happen that at Columbia. You, well, MGM, everybody's lost, so they couldn't help you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I, I, I'm so impressed, as you can imagine. So anyway, I walk in and knock on the door, and here is this crowded little office with two animation desks. I don't know if you've ever seen them, that they have the disc with the light comes up. And this man is there, and he says, yes. And I said, well, I'm, I'm Margaret Carey, and I'm supposed to see Mark Davis. He said, I'm Mark Davis, come on in. He said, what do you have there? And what I had brought, because I had been in the business too long just to walk in and say, hi, hire me. You know, you have to show them something. I had done 
the night before to some music on a little, you remember 45 records? Yes. Yeah. I brought in 45 records and a record player with me besides my pictures. And uh, he says, what's that? I said, well, I wanted to show you how I could do Panavon. And uh, so he said, great. So he asked me to do one thing first and I'll get back to that. And so he, he couldn't find a plug. Now we're talking Disney again. So a friend popped his face in and happened to be the director of Peter Pan. And he came in, he says, what? He says, where's the plug? Where can we plug this? These guys got down on their hands and knees and found the plug. I mean, that was my start at Disney and they're still like that today. They really, really are. So anyway, I said, I set up a choreography a little bit of a nine-year-old boy fixing his breakfast. And so they said, well, do it, you know, and I'll do just a piece of it for you. You still got it. <laughs> so they, they were interested. Thank you. So <clears throat> he said, well, what we're doing, and now I looked up and I could see on all the walls were sketches of this most adorable little creature with wings. All different ways that she was stamped. And there were large sketches on white paper, just line drawings. And I wanted to see them, I wanted to see them, but he said, now we'll tell you what we want the first scene for her to do. And I will do you, do the scene for you, if you remember it. Do you remember her landing on the mirror? Mm -hmm. Okay, I played her as if she were a nine-year-old little girl who had never seen a mirror before. And so this is how it went. days I got a phone call would it can be convenient for you to come to work next Tuesday but you see the difference of what has happened with the years that have flown by I she, she was this little innocent little girl who saw herself for the first time and what do we do now when we see her we see she's preening herself no I never did it that way it was like oh that's me because Tinkerbell is always around the corner is some excitement. That's the whole thing in life, right? So <clears throat> anyway, to the, the work that I did was this. They would call me because I'm doing the TV show, a TV show, my own on Channel 13. I was doing radio shows at the same time. Then they would clear my schedule, clear their schedule, and then they would book the big sound stage. Well. I tell you, the sound stage was magic. And all of these pictures are on this huge sound stage with a, what they call a cyclorama behind me with about 25 lights, 35 millimeter camera, whole crew, and Mark Davis sitting there telling me what she's supposed to do next. And you know what? He gave me my head. He said, let's see what you come up with. It was just, I'm quirky anyway, 
So they seemed to like it. I would step out in front, <clears throat> in front of the camera, try something, and say, they would usually say, hit your marks over here and not over there. We like it, let's, let's, let's take it. But one day, I, <clears throat> the big, huge doors that you have up on sound stages that you can let trucks in, you know, well, we had it open because, if you remember, Tinker Bell didn't talk in the movie. Now, if any of you have noticed, I'm a talker. Uh. So it's really odd. But anyway, I watched this shadow of men. You know, the sun was behind them and this group of men, and there was Buddy Epson. And I'm looking at the group. They go over against the wall, <clears throat> and they're working on a project while I'm doing this Tinkerbell. And they would finish up and then, are you ready? Walt Disney would come over to see how it was going. Do you know the odds of me meeting Walt Disney were about that much because he was the head of the studio. And I was taught that the head of the studio is God and you never get to see a head of the studio. <laughs> he came over and they, I was invited into the conversation and uh, I, I'm standing there like a schoolgirl, as you can imagine, because the first two times that he came over and chatted, I thought, he's the head of the studio. That was terrifying to me. I, you have to curtsy when you see them, uh, or bow, or whatever. And then the second, uh, the fourth and fifth time, it suddenly dawned on me, it was Walt Disney. And he was charming, just a dear. He came over and somebody had told him that I had gone to school with his daughters, which I had, and he, he brought it up. I mean, we're still talking about the head of the studio. Brought it up, and I said, yes, uh, Diane was in lower grade and Sharon was in an upper grade, and he said, uh, I think they liked you. I thought, it was a great phrase. <laughs> now the question comes, why would Walt Disney be working on Soundstage 1 when I was working, why didn't he get his own sound stage, right? Ladies and gentlemen, they only had one sound stage. Uh -huh. that was, that was, and those were the days. So working with Mark Davis, a, an absolute genius. I said, I hope I can do it, Miss White. But he said, we want her to be grumpy. And I said, how grumpy? I mean, I, I, I tell you, this man took a sheet of paper and a pencil and drew her face in, I would say, less than a minute, turned it around, and there was Tinkerbell Grumpy. A genius, an absolute genius. So I want you to remember him because he was so kind and, and all the rest of them. Come back because he changed my direction. Okay, so the next thing that I'm doing is, yes, that's the one. <clears throat> Whoops, it's not. Try the next one. Next one, maybe we don't have it. That's it. <laughs> he called me up and he said, Margaret? I said, yes, Mr. Davis. I mean, those were the days when you didn't call them by their first name. And I hope you can see this because he said, how would you like to do the voiceover and be the model for the red-headed mermaid? I said, well, you know, if I can make it. No, I said, yes, I would love to. I would love to. So he also did The Red-Headed Mermaid. I hope you could see it. And that was the one where I had the line, we just wanted to drown her. <laughs> and I worked with a lady named June Foray. Now, some of you may know that name. Some of you have watched Rocky and Bullwinkle. Mm -hmm. She's the voice of Rocky. Oh. She's one of the great voices. Mulan, she was the grandmother, you know? Benny, you should have brought back a man. You remember the line that she, she had? Well, June and I were standing out after we had recorded the, the track. You, you start out with the track, you record that, and then you match all the other things to the track. And we're standing, why are we worried about being in front of the camera? This is the way to go. I mean, you're called in at one o'clock in the afternoon. You don't have to wear makeup. You don't have to put a costume on. You don't have to learn lines. I mean, it's, it's just wonderful. So June and I decided, well, she's pretty much decided because we've done radio together. Um, and I'm, what, 
22, something like that, that we're going to go do voiceovers, and I'm going to get into voiceovers in just a minute. <clears throat> Are there any questions that you, I don't, remember I'm 90 years old, so you have to shout them out. Um, any questions about working with how we did it? Anything on the stage? Oh my gosh. Am I that good? Yeah. Wow. Okay, I will show you another reason that I was chosen to be Tinkerbell. Somebody calling me on the phone? You had a phone call, I muted it for you. Uh -huh. Missed it. Ha, huh, look at that. This is new to me. Uh -huh. <laughs> Turn that off, there we go. All right. <clears throat> now you little ladies watch this because you want to be Tinkerbell. You can watch it too. <laughs> okay. Now everybody, I'm gonna walk up there and walk back. All right. So this is my walk. Not bad. Not bad. You know? It's a walk. But let me show you Tinkerbell's walk, okay? This is Tinkerbell's walk. <laughs> she does, she goes, and she goes, and when she turns things, and she looks, and she sees this, <gasps> look at her wings. <laughs> <laughs> That's Tinkerbell, and why do I, why did I bring that to it? I am a dancer. <clears throat> That's why at 90 years old, I still tap dance on the stage is because I'm a dancer, so I'm urging everybody to take dancing lessons. I really am. You could be so healthy. Forget all the grunt work. You know, just <laughs> dance. But watch her again as she does anything. Everything that she looks at is a dancer looking at it. Every movement that she makes. And that's what sets her apart from all the other characters. Whoops, I'm not talking on the microphone anymore. <laughs> All right, so we have. Excuse me. Yes, thank delivered. you so much. Is that for you or for me? <laughs> but you know, I am going to get a uh, drink of water. This is so funny to me. I was brought up in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. You would never see a woman drinking out of a bottle. I had to teach myself how to do it when this started to come in. The first time, I'm glad I had a change of clothes. <laughs> you stayed dry that time. Now, I'm going to tell you how great Mark Davis was. This is an unabridged Peter Pan book by James M. Berry. It's my favorite book. And 1911, when Mark Davis took over of trying to draw and come up with an idea for Tinkerbell, she had never been seen. She was a flash of light. That's all she was. She still was, is on stage plays. She's a flash of light. So, all he had to go by was this one thing that was in his, this book, a half a paragraph. And now I would like to show off, because I'm going to read this to you in an English dialect. Uh -huh. All right, and it goes. The little light lights kept burning brightly as Mr. and Mrs. Darling left for the party. But there was another light in the room. It was a much brighter light, and in the time that it has taken for me to tell you, it has been in all the drawers and all the pockets in the nursery looking for Peter Pan's shadow. But when it stops, you can see that it is more than a light. It is a girl, a fairy, Tinkerbell, who is clothed in a skeletal leaf cut low and square, which showed her figure to best advantage. <laughs> That's it. 
That's all this man had to go by. And you know what came out. It was just so amazing. I'm doing a, a narration of a new Peter Pan show for little kids up in Las Vegas. I'm doing that in December. But did it ever, you heard me do a British accent. It isn't a true British accent because when we do dialects, we really don't get true. It's so that you can understand the book. But does, did it ever occur to you that it's so strange that Bobby Driscoll playing Peter Pan did not speak in a British accent? <laughs> Think about that. Everyone else in the movie spoke with a British accent except Bobby Driscoll. Now, Bobby could have done it. Bobby was a great actor. In the, the dance sequence there that you see from the movie, If You Knew Susie, he was my brother. And we went to school together on the set. And he, uh, whether you know it or not, Bobby also uh, received a junior Oscar for the work that he did in the movie called The Window. He got reports that if they didn't believe his character, that movie would never have worked. He was a, a very lonely little boy because we all were lonely. We didn't have friends over. We just worked and did this. But here he is as Peter Pan. And it, it, the last time that I saw Bobby, he was in his green tights and his outfit. <clears throat> and we were both rushing for the commissary because I wanted some chocolate and he wanted some ice cream. And the commissary was just closing. And he looked sideways at me and I looked sideways at him and I figured a kid in green tights is going to get a better reception than me standing there in my regular dress. So we banged on the door. The manager let us in finally and he gave us the chocolates and the ice cream for free because everything was locked down. And we went away and I said, the last thing I said to Bobby, as I went out, I said, well, wait a minute. I went back and got a bunch of napkins. And I said, well, I was your sister and the last one who looked after you, the last movie we did. So I can just see what ice cream could do to green tights and Peter Pan. <laughs> so I, I tucked uh, napkins around his neck so he wouldn't uh, get messy. And he says, thanks, sis. And all the way he went. And I never saw him again. He was just a dear person. OK, now. I told you about Hal Smith, told you about going into voiceover, okay? So I'm going to show you how talented I am. I want you to understand that, and I'm gonna tell you a couple of funny jokes, and you may laugh, all right? Okay, I just wanna, you know, oh, laugh at Tinkerbell, come on. So anyway. I did, I've done about 600 cartoon voices, including Clutch Cargo, Three mm. Stooges, uh, which I think if you turn that over, there I am as Mrs. Highfalutin. <laughs> and uh, we did a live openings and closing, but they got me because of voices. So, Hal Smith was, did voices. So we got on either side of the microphone, so let me tell you, I speak 21 different dialects and have about 48 different voices. And how do you get dialects? I will tell you with Hal Smith. And this is one of my favorite stories. I'm standing there with the uh, a microphone and I have the script and I said, Hal, Hal, I'm supposed to do German. I don't know German. How do I do German? He says, you need to do German you step right over here into this corner, and I will show you how to do German. You need a sentence. I said, I need a sentence? He says, yeah, my sentence is, she was looking out the window when I saw her. I said, okay. She was looking out the window when I saw her. And I walked back to the microphone, and I could do a German accent. That's the way that we learn. Well, now, if you promise not to tell anybody, because this is not politically correct. I don't see any hands up with the problem. Okay. <laughs> this was when you could do all different kinds of Spanish, Mexican, all, all those. It is now not politically correct. But he was doing a, a Jewish accent. 
And if you do a Jewish accent, it flows into a Southern accent. It is so hard to get out of it. So he says, I don't, I don't know. I said, you're having trouble with the Jewish accent? Come over here into the corner and I will show you. So he stepped over and I said, just change all the vowels, put the whole thing up in the top of your throat and use a lot of phlegm. <laughs> and so back he goes that he could do that. So we went back and forth, but here is one of the main stories that I tell when I, I go to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, give talks and, and libraries all around and have a wonderful time. And this is one of the stories that I told always on stage because I loved it. Turned out there was a reason, you'll find out. And this is over in Ireland. Now this is one of the funny st stories that you can laugh at, okay? I give you permission. <laughs> anyway, it's this one. Oh, they're talking about diversity. And one of them says, I like being an Irishman, I think. He says, but you know, I, I, the other one says, I think I'd like to be Italian. All the girls come for you if you're Italian, you know? And they look around and they say, let's go over and ask Paddy what he thinks. Well, Paddy's over in the corner, drinking him up pretty good. And they walk over and he says, Paddy, his what is it? He says, what would you be if you weren't Irish? Patty says, I'd be ashamed. <laughs> well, I told that all my life, and it turns out when I found my family after 50 years, they're Irish and Scots. So uh, there was a reason. Yes, yes. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you another one to show you how talented I am. Are you ready for this? Sure. I want you to just be amazed. <laughs> all right. There are two twits what are sitting on the curb over in London. And they're talking to each other, and finally one of them looks up, he says, you see that ball up in the sky? And the other one says, yeah, what about it? He says, that's the moon. He says, no, it's not, that's the sun. No, it's the moon. And they sit there arguing with each other. And finally, they look down up the street, and here comes a dowager duchess, and all her jewelry and her cane as she comes walking in. And he says, I know, I'll ask your ladyship. She'll know. So he pops up, he says, begging your pardon, your ladyship. Yes, what is it? You see that ball up in the sky? Yes, I do, what about it? Is that the sun or the moon? How should I know? I don't live around here. <laughs> <laughs> so I have done, uh, the last thing that I, I have been doing, besides all these shows, I have been um, working in radio for 12 years, and I have a radio commercial that's still running at 90 years of age, pretty doggone good. And then I got an email from a lady said, would you like to um, reacquaint yourself with a fellow named Bob Boki? And I went, Bob Boki, I knew him 70 years ago. I dated Bob Boki. <laughs> well, I was up to the Andy Griffith Show because I, I travel for them also. I'm in two episodes. I'm one of the seven couples. You know, nobody's married on the Andy Griffith Show. There's only seven couples of it. And uh, so we talk and we talk and we get nicer and nicer nicer and nicer. I said, I'm going to be up in North Carolina doing uh, at Mount Airy, do it, turning it into Mayberry Days. He said, I'll drive up from South Carolina, which he did. And he said, I have my 94th birthday first, and then I'll be up to see you. And we took one look at each other. It was love at first sight. And I'm getting married in February. <laughs> oh, wow. Congratulations. He's, he's buying a house for me, just the right one that he wants. He's scouring Sarasota, I think, is where we'll probably end up. Now, to finish up what we're talking here, I mean, that's a Disney story for 70 years. Can I tell you quick? I don't have a lot of jewelry, but he gave me a bracelet when he was going to USC and I was dating him. You know, I walked over to my jewelry box and picked out that bracelet. It's the only piece of jewelry I've ever saved. 
Yeah. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so, let me get back now to Mark Davis. First of all, any questions? Yes. When you did the session as Tinkerbell, how long, how many hours in a day was like a session? Oh, good point. Um, sometimes it was three days. My problem was, you see, I was working all the other shows. And so they would try to squeeze everything into one day if they possibly could. And then they would call me the next week to do, to do it again. Uh, everybody, that was the time when television was threatening the movies. So you did everything. You did radio, you did anything you possibly could. And so they made way for my schedule. It took me nine months over the time uh, to get it. There were 635,000, 635, 635,000 pieces of art to make the, the movie Peter Pan. I thought they were crazy. Who would, you know, do that? And then, did you ever realize how funny Peter Pan is? I, I, they flew me over to London, and it was a press conference, one of the anniversaries, I can't remember which, and we stayed at the Dorchester, my dears. Uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, and so we, they took over a house and turn, turned into the Darling House and, and all this. And two things about that that I wanted to tell you. One was I asked many of the um, reporters and those who were writers there, what word would they come up to explain Tinkerbell? What would be the word that they would use? It's not easy. It took me a long time. And two of them tried, and it was okay. But I'm going to give you that word that they used in 300 articles that came out then. And the word is, she is beguiling. Oh. She, she warms your heart when she's very bad. She warms your heart when she's very good. And I use the word, she's beguiling. And I love it. And the man, and I'm... Uh, any other questions? Because I'm finishing up now. I'm not sure I got the name correctly. Hans Conway, did he do multiple voices in Peter Pan? I am 90 years old. I have no idea what you said. Oh, Hans Conway? Is that correct? Did Hans Conway do multiple voices in Peter Pan besides both? Uh, I did the, I think you're asking me, did I do any other voices in, in no, Peter Pan? Hans Conley. What about Hans? Did he do multiple voices? That's the question. Oh, Hans could do anything. He could turn into a girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he had the best girl's voice you ever heard. What a dear. Uh, that's interesting that you ask about him. Um, but. And I was going to tell you one other thing about, well, I can't remember it now. I'm 90 years old, so everybody forgives me. <laughs> but I wanted to just, if there are no other questions and answers, okay. I wanted to tell you the most wonderful thing that happened to me. It happened, oh, maybe eight years ago, and I will never forget it. I was called up to Andreas Zeja, one of the great animators of all times, to his castle. And that's a castle that he has in um, Burbank. Um, and they were shooting a video in, um, about Mark Davis. And of course, I'm a talker. All of you will know that from now on. You cannot deny it. Um, so I, they're asking me all these questions. And I'm giving them all the answers. And I'm sitting in this chair. And Andreas comes down and put some papers in my lap. And he said, how do you feel about these? This is a hard one. They were the same pages that I had seen up on the walls at Mark's office. And I said, how do I feel about it? Give me a Kleenex. <laughs> it was so wonderful to know that he is so highly thought of, and what a wonderful gentleman, and a, and a, a genius along with it. Um, now I'm going to give you all an assignment. This is not a plug, but if you might know, I brought some of these books if anybody wants to buy. 
these books as a gift, or and I sign them, and I also um, put any name down that you would like that, that's clean. <laughs> and uh, it's over at my table, and I don't know where my table is, but Jenny knows. Uh, <laughs> she, she will lead me back. Um, <clears throat> But, here is your assignment. Good old um, Peter Pan was written by a man who said and wrote many, many times afterwards, J.M. Barry, he said, I have given the little fairy a very important job to do. I want you to find out on your own why he thought it was so important. In all the years that I've traveled, I have not had one child who is named Tinker. Isn't that interesting? That, you know, it's a nickname, yes. But why? Tinker? Bell. You can talk to me over at the, I'll give you hints if you come, you know, come over the table if you want to. But I'm assigning you to do because I want you to get back into the real story of Peter Pan and find out that Wendy did not love Peter, Peter did not love Wendy, uh, Tinkerbell was a groupie. Um, one, of my, one, of my, one of my favorite parts of it was the Lost Boys, where there are twins with the Lost Boys and Peter does not know what a twin is and they're not allowed to tell him because the minute that they tell him, that means that they will know more than Peter and they will be kicked out. I mean, things like that. It, it just, it, Disney's Peter Pan's fabulous. But the book is even more fabulous. And so I am assigning you all. Now, how you're going to get the information to me, I have no idea. But if I can find a, a, a husband-to-be from 70 years ago, you can track me down on tinkerbelltalks.com and say, I, this is what I, Margaret told me to do, and I will get back to you on it. Anything else that you would like to know? Um, I'm five foot two, if you need to know that. My blood type is A, positive, <laughs> and I hate electronics. Uh, otherwise, I love you all, Tinkerbell loves you all, and are you ready? You're gonna answer me back now. It's faith and trust and oh you're wonderful thank you for coming i hope you had a good time thank you very much that was that was amazing